this morning's scripture. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Luke, and we're going to be specifically in chapter 15. Uh, that's where we're hanging out. Verse, uh, verse 11 is where we're going to start today, but we're going to back it up just a, a hair this morning. Um, and before I begin reading, uh, let's, let's actually pray together, and we'll get into God's Word. God, thank you for today. We thank you for just the... Um, ability that we have this morning, God, to come to know you, to come to hear you through your word. Um, God, we pray that you get specific with us today. Um, God, that you would point out things in us, God, that you want to change for the better. God, that you would point out ways that, um, God, that we can commit to following you better. Um, but ultimately, God, we just want to hear what you have to say about who you are. God, that's of the utmost importance today, is us coming to know you and coming to know you better. I pray that this morning, God, that you would just, um, Holy Spirit, you would just push our hearts in a direction, God, that's more um, focused on who you are, that's more focused on what your word says about you, and what your word says about us and our role here in this earth, God. And so we just, um, we thank you just for the opportunity this morning that you've given us to, to be alive, God, and to be in your presence, and we don't take that lightly. We lean in and we listen to you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So uh, as we read the Bible, uh, a good thing to do um, when you're reading just some random verses maybe out of the Scripture is to go and look back at uh, what's actually happening throughout the rest of the Scripture to kind of paint you a, a, a good picture of you know, why Jesus may be saying something or why Scripture is telling you something. is to go back and to read the context around what is being said. And so um, today's the, the bulk of today's verse is going to be starting in uh, chapter 15, verse 11, but we're going to back it up just a little bit to verse 1, and you'll kind of see uh, what kind of brings this, this moment, why, why Jesus begins to tell this, this story and this parable. It's because in, uh, in verse 1 in chapter 15, it says, Now tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, talking about Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And so uh, Jesus, off the bat, he was never afraid of that term guilt by association or like you are who you hang around. Y'all heard that before. Uh, Jesus wasn't concerned about that. That might be true to an extent in our lives, but um, a lot of times throughout Scripture and throughout the Gospels, you'll see Jesus being around people who the religious leaders thought like, eh, he probably shouldn't be hanging around them. If he's the Messiah, if he's this, uh, if he's this guy that is who he says he is, why is he hanging out with these people? And that's what the Pharisees, the, the rulers of the religious law, they're trying to accuse him. They always try to trip him up and to catch him in something. And they're saying, why is Jesus hanging out with these people? And that's what kind of fuels Jesus' fire here to kind of give them this, these parables that he's going to talk about. Um, but Jesus was known for associating with sinners. And it's not because like, oh, he was just hanging around them because he liked hanging around them. Uh, Jesus, his point of hanging around sinners and his point of hanging around people uh, that uh, seemed like they, they were too far off from God was to bring them close to God. That was the point. And so uh, the Pharisees, they thought that their, their righteousness came through segregating themselves away from people. But, but the way of God is Jesus getting into the mess and getting into the lives of other people who didn't look like they should be following him or around him uh, or let alone eating with him. And so um, Jesus kind of comes off the, the hills of that and he starts speaking in parables. And the object of these parables wasn't just to like, okay, Jesus is just going to make a cute story so that uh, they'll understand him better. Part of that's true, but an, another part of that is so that people who didn't want to follow Jesus would be dismissed from, from being around him. Jesus was trying to make a, a greater truth apparent to people who wanted to come to know him and wanted to follow him closely. And so that's the, that's the purpose of these parables. And, and Jesus' point of this is to show these Pharisees and show these religious leaders is that lost people matter to God. Hey, that's one of our core values, right? We didn't just make that up. That came through Scripture and through Jesus' interactions with people every day is that lost people matter to him. And so there was a, a parable about the lost sheep. There was a parable about the lost coin. Go back and read it. It's just as good. But we're going to focus on verse 11 this morning. It's going to be talking about the, the parable of the lost son. Uh, this could also say lost sons because there's another brother in this story. Um, but Jesus is trying to, to make his point um, that God values people and God values people who are lost. 
And that's who he came for. There's scripture throughout the Gospels that says, you know, Jesus came uh, not for the healthy people, right? But he, he came for the sick. He came for people who knew that they're in, in need of a Savior, in need of a Messiah. And so all the time, the, the Pharisees were just trying to accuse him of, like, being against who he said he was. And so um, this is Jesus communicating his message to them is that lost people matter to God. And so uh, we have this younger and older brother. And so uh, we have the bulk of this scripture talking about uh, this prodigal son. If you've been in church for a while, you may have heard this. But I don't want to assume that everybody knows the Bible because a lot of people don't. Um, but you may have heard the story before. But Jesus uh, gives them this parable. He says in verse 11, he says, And he said to them, There was a man who had two sons. In verse 12, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. So the people of that time would have known very well what that meant. If there, were, if there was a dad and he had two sons, uh, when you died, your estate, all your belongings, all your possessions, all your money, all of your land, uh, two-thirds of that would go to the older brother and a third of that would go to the younger brother. How many of y'all are older sibling in here? Yeah, y'all y'all be getting more. So y'all are y'all are cool like that. Um, but uh, but but Jesus is he's going on and he's explaining this parable to them. He says that there was this dad or these two sons, and the 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 son said to his father, "Give me my share of property that is coming uh, to me." And so that sounds like okay, we'll just you know just give him what you owe him, I guess. But uh, this implies some some pretty crazy things in here, and, and what's really, really crazy about this request from this son um, for his father to give him his share of belongings is that this was basically like the father's uh, last will, essentially. This was something that would happen after the father died. This wasn't something that would just happen like, oh, okay, I'll just go ahead and give it to you. This is his entire life, his entire savings, his entire property, his entire identity and the son is saying here essentially to the father you're better off dead to me that's what he's saying i hope my kid never says that to me um but that's essentially what this guy is saying to his dad is that i would be better off if i had what you were to give me um after you died you are better off to me dead and so um he's wishing the father's uh pretty much like his, his, his whole entire everything to come to an end just for him. And so he wants the father's things, but he doesn't want the father. He wants the wealth, the comfort, all these things, but not this relationship. He wants it severed. And so um, it was unheard of back then for somebody to say something like this uh, to their father. If somebody did that, they probably would have been banished. They probably would have been beaten and driven out of their house. But, but the father being who he was, he said, Okay, if you want to go, that's on you. If you want to go, I'm going to give you your share of what's coming to you. Um, and so the father literally divided his life between them. And so uh, the Greek word for that is bios. That means life. So it's not just like money. It's his status. It's his well-being. It's everything that he had built up in his life. He's going to give his son that share of that. Uh, back then, your identity was really, really closely tied to with your possessions, your land, how much things that you had. And so for you to just give this away, it's communicating to not just your, your, the people in your family, but everybody in that community that something really bad has happened because it's usually after this person had already died. And so the father went ahead and did it anyway. And so we see this as a clear illustration of, of God's love for us and God's relationship with us, that his love allowed this rebellion in a sense, that he respected this, this will of this son, uh, that the father knew that even though this was a foolish request, even though this was a terrible request, he allowed him to do it nonetheless. And that speaks to us that, man, God is not forcing us to be in a relationship with him. God is never going to force you to follow him. If you want to leave him, if you want to go the opposite opposite way in a different direction God will allow you to do that right and we're going to see what happens though when we choose to live a life opposite to the things of God when we choose to go in a different direction uh, I started thinking about this story and I started thinking like what what made this son all of a sudden come to this request what had to have happened to get this son to this place where he thought like okay, I'm going to go ahead and just ask my father to give me all of his stuff and basically wish him better off dead. And so um, 
what happened to get him to leave his family behind? What happened to get him uh, to leave the love of his family, the security of his father, and to go his own way? And I started thinking it, it's, it's probably things that aren't too different from our feelings when we begin to stray away from, from God. Um, sometimes things look more appealing in life, right? Sometimes uh, things in life tend to distract us to the point where we think, that going our own way is better. It could be our flesh. It could be some sin that we're struggling with that's keeping us from God. Maybe it's the, 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 the fear of the unknown of following Jesus. Like, I don't know if this is the right decision. I don't really know if I should commit to this lifestyle. Uh, maybe it's just uh, what the Bible says a lot of times that we grow weary of doing good. Maybe we're just tired of it. Uh, whatever it was happening with this son, it probably wasn't just something that happened overnight. Like, hey, you know what? This place stinks. I'm going to go ahead and ask my father to pretty much be better off dead and give me my inheritance. It probably wasn't just some overnight thing. It was probably a, a, a small thought, a small you know, decision, something over and over, some sort of compromise, some sort of thing that, that led him to eventually think, and you know what? There might be a better way than being in my father's house. There might be a better life outside of here than what my father has given me. And I think that's the way that it happens with us a lot of times. Maybe there is some big event in our life. Maybe there is something that just happens that just shatters our world, and we begin to stray away from following Jesus. But a lot of times, our, our straying away from the things of God doesn't just happen through some one huge moment. It's a lot of little things piled up into one. It's a lot of decisions that we make like, okay, well, maybe I'll choose this instead, or maybe I'll go to this instead, or maybe I won't devote much uh, of this time of my life to the things of God, or maybe like I'll, I'll continue to make these decisions over and over again that are going to take me away from the people of God. They're going to take me out of God's presence. That's going to keep me from listening to the, to the word of God. Like all these things in our lives a lot of times we, we uh, let these things snowball up into a point where we're, we're just kind of on our way out. And I started thinking, unfortunately, just like about people in my life or maybe friends that I've had in the past or just people in, in life that I see. Um, and you may know people in your life that this has happened as well. Like you see them following Jesus, but over time, slowly but surely, little things begin to creep in. Little things that seem, you know, just maybe not that big of a deal uh, turn into another thing. And that leads to somewhere else. And that leads to something else. And then all of a sudden, you don't see them anymore. All of a sudden, maybe they're not believing anymore. And all of a sudden, they've made their way out of following Jesus. And it, it, a lot of times that comes by just small decisions over and over to keep us away from the things of God. And I think that might be what's happening with the son. But it's definitely what happens with us a lot of times. And I think that, um, that as believers, we have to guard ourselves against like, man, what are some things that are, are leading you away from the people of God? What are things that are leading you out of church? What are things that are leading you away from taking God's word seriously? Um, those things are different for everybody in this room, but we have to be aware of them because if we're not careful, little things over time accumulate to big things, and big things happen to lead us away from the presence of God. And so this, uh, this son, he's decided, like, there's something better for me uh, uh, somewhere else, essentially. And so it says in verse 13, it says, Not many days later... The younger son had gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. He wasted it. Parties, wild things, living it up, prostitutes, whatever it was that you could think of a young man at this time with a bunch of money unsupervised uh, could do with it. He probably did with it. Um, and I think this is such a, a picture of when we live a life of sin, when we enter into a life of sin, it's like we're almost wasting an inheritance from God. Like God has laid out like who we are and, and all the things that he's ready to give us and all the things that he's doing in our lives and all the ways that he's working and moving. And a lot of times when we choose uh, this lifestyle of sin or we choose to go in an opposite direction, it's like us wasting an inheritance from God. Right, Because God has a plan for all of our lives. God has a purpose for all of our lives, right? But it's, but it's up to us to stay in tune with like, man, am I going to follow that? Am I going to believe in that? Am I going to trust in that? Or am I going to go another way? Am I going to really believe that God has some inheritance for me in, in the name of Jesus, through the, through the cross of Jesus, a purpose for my life? Or am I going to waste it? Am I going to do something with it? 
And so that's what happens here. He's living a life of sin, and he's essentially wasting his inheritance from his father. And I started thinking about how, like, man, it's, it's funny how our definition sometimes of, of freedom and the world's definition of freedom actually leads us to bondage, actually leads us to being tied up. And so I started thinking of this analogy of, like, uh, uh, a fence, right? I've got a fence in my backyard, and unfortunately, a tree fell on it, and it's broken right now. Um, but the purpose of you having a fence, or the purpose of at least me having a fence in my backyard, is so that I can let my dogs out, and they can run around freely. Um, I had a dog. He died last year. Uh, God rest his little soul, but um, I'm more sad about it than that. But uh, he, he, um, he, he would jump the fence all the time, and uh, and he, he was so prone to, like, just looking at things outside of that fence uh, that seemed better for him, that seemed more interesting for him. They probably were more interesting for him. But he would jump the fence all the time. So I started thinking about that. So right now our, our fence is broken from the storm. And so we're having to, like, eyeball our dogs every time they go out there and, like, you know, watch them do their business, unfortunately, uh, just so we can call them back in the house. Um, Side note, if you know a fence company that you can recommend to me, it'd be great uh, because all of them are really slow right now. But um, I started thinking about this concept of a fence. A, a fence is, is used to provide safety, right? It's, it's to provide freedom within the confounds of, of where you are. Uh, 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 it's, it's, it's meant to provide safety. Maybe it's for your kids. Maybe it's for a dog, whatever it is. Like You don't go past this point because past this point is danger. Past this point is something unknown. Past this point is, is where, you know, sometimes uh, what leads you into a life uh, uh, of distress, what leads you into a life of sin. And so I, I thought about that just in our relationship with God. Like a lot of times we, we get this fleshly desire to, to leave the things of God or to leave this fence because what seems like it's on the other side of that is something that's going to be good for us. Or maybe it's something that's more appealing or something that's like, unknown that we just haven't ventured to before and, and this definition of freedom in our lives we begin to think like man all the all the things that God has asked me to stay in or all the things that God has asked me to do or not do they seem like they're like confining in my life but that's actually freedom living within within the confines of who God says he is and what God has designed for our lives it it, it looks to the world like that's constricting but to us it's freedom it's freedom, it's protection, it, it, it's away from danger, it's away from the things of the world. And a lot of times we just get our, our minds so wrapped up in, man, being outside of the things of God, that seems like freedom. But inside the things of God is where we actually find freedom. That's, why we, that's where we find safety, that's where we find our protection. And so this son right here, he's gone outside uh, uh, of the reach of his father thinking that something else is going to bring him satisfaction. But what he learns is that what he thinks is going to bring him freedom, what he thinks is going to bring him satisfaction actually is the thing that that makes him feel like he's in a prison it's the thing that that binds him up and so there's freedom inside the fence there's freedom inside the, the ways of Jesus the ways of God and this guy's forgotten about that in verse 14 it says that when he had spent everything a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. So any, any Jew back then, any righteous Jew, any self-respecting uh, Jew back then, this would have been a big no-no. Like, you're not hanging around pigs. Uh, they were known as filthy and as un and unclean. They were the bottom of the barrel as far as uh, animals go. Uh, so you didn't really want to work with them. You didn't really... Uh, want to, you, you weren't going to eat them, so for you bacon lovers uh, out there, just not happening, um, but they're the bottom of the barrel when it comes to animals, and so this is such a great picture of where, where this thought of being outside of the will of the Father has led this son. It's led him to a place where it's literal filth, literal filth, and so that he's longing to be fed with the things um, that the pigs are eating. I don't know about y'all, but I don't think I don't think I've ever been that hungry. I hope I'll never be that hungry. Um, I thought about uh, I thought about Golden Corral earlier when they said that, and that that might be what was in these uh, troughs here. But uh, but this is just a powerful contrast that we have right here. That that the son with the father, 
the son with the father, he had all the things that he needed. He had this protection, he had this security, he had this belonging. But outside of the father, outside of the things of God, that's where his life began to fall apart. And it's this, this picture of sin, this picture of rebellion that we have going our own way, thinking that we know better than God. It will always leave us in waste. It will always leave us wanting something that we shouldn't desire. And it's left this son wanting something that he should never desire. This wasn't his place. This wasn't his purpose. This isn't where he was supposed to be. This isn't what he was supposed to be longing for. But his idea of just slowly getting outside of the things of the Father has led him to this place. Verse 17, and I love the first sentence of this verse. It says, but when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. That first sentence right there is so powerful. It says, when he came to himself, he had this moment. It's like the light bulb went off in his head. It's like the realization of where he had gotten himself, what he had done with his life, finally came to light in his own mind. The misery, the shame, the agony, the realization of where he finally was was too much that he woke up. It's like, that, it's like he was asleep and unaware of actually who he was. And I think that this is such an image of what sin does to us. When we live a life of sin, when we get out and away from the things of God, it's like sin lulls us to sleep. It's like we, we forget who we are. It, we forget who we're created to be. We forget who God is. We forget the purpose of our lives when we let sin creep in like this and lead us away. Because sin makes us forget who we truly are. We have a purpose. God created us for more. God created us. We're made in his image. We're not a mistake. We're created for a unique purpose. God loves us. God forgives us. He saves us. We have this, this grace through faith. We have this identity in Christ when we come to know Christ. But when sin creeps in, it's like we forget about all that. It's like we forget about who we truly were created to be. And this is what's happened to this son. He has a purpose. He has a destiny. He has a life to be lived. But because of his, his going away from the Father, it's like he's forgotten that. But it says when he came to himself, when he came to himself. So I'm praying that this morning um, that may, many of us will have that same realization. And maybe you've had that realization at some point in your life where you have just been far from God You've been doing things that are opposite of what God's called you to do. You've been living a life of sin, and it finally just catches up with you. Enough is enough, and it finally makes you think, man, I've got to go a different way. I'm coming to my senses. If that's you, I pray that this morning that you'll take hold of that thought, and don't let that thought just flee your mind, right? Because that's conviction from the Holy Spirit. That's conviction from God, not to shame you, and we're going to learn here what that means, not to shame you, but to lead you into a better life. So if you've been feeling that way, if you've been feeling like, man, I just need to lay some things down, I need to repent, I need to go in a different way than I'm going, take hold of that thought this morning and really put some action behind it, because that's what's, that's what's about to happen here in this story. He's been convicted, he's been made to feel like, man, I've been living this life, I've been living the wrong way. I've been doing things that are opposite to, to what I was created for, opposite of my purpose. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. And I love that he says this because it's nobody's fault but his own. He's disconnected from his family, but he didn't start pointing fingers. He didn't blame his father. He didn't say, well, if my father would have tried harder or would have maybe talked me out of this, maybe I wouldn't be in such a mess, right? Or maybe if my brother would have said something earlier or like maybe he would have helped me out a little bit more, I wouldn't find myself in this situation. Or maybe if my friends would have like reached out to me more or done more for me, I wouldn't have found myself here. And a lot of times when we get ourselves in a mess, when we, when we decide to go the opposite way, I know things happen in life and things happen in church and, and people kind of stray off or maybe that's been you in the past. Um, but a lot of times we, we've got to get to the point where we take personal responsibility for our sin. We take personal responsibility for where we are in our relationship with Jesus, right? It is not anybody else's job to get you closer to Jesus, 
It's between you and God. But we have to put forth this effort. And we can't, we can't go about pointing fingers when we fall off course or when we feel dis- disconnected from the people of God or the things of God and say, well, it's, it's their fault. Well, they made me feel like this. I know things like that happen. Things like that happen in church. Things like that happen in life. I'm not dismissing that. But when we make a conscious effort and a conscious decision over time, over and over to do things, to engage in things, to, to think thoughts that lead us away from the things of God, to lead us away from the people of God, we have got to be ready to take personal responsibility for that. Because our repentance, it's not up to anybody else. It's not up to anybody else to ask for forgiveness for us. It's not up to anybody else for us to, for us to be led to a place of, of forgiveness and repentance with God. It is up to ourselves. We have to have that moment of conviction in our own lives where we say enough is enough. I'm responsible for this. God, against only you have I sinned. That's what he's saying to his father. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. He's got to take this personal responsibility and that's what's going to lead him in this moment of repentance. And it says in verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Our point is that repentance requires action. Repentance requires action. It says that he arose and he came to his father. Repentance is more than just feeling bad. It's more than just feeling sorry about something that you have done. Repentance, it's more than just feeling crummy about your situation. It's turning around and it's walking back to Jesus. It's walking back to God. That is what repentance is. Uh, Richard explains that so many times uh, when when he's preaching, when he's giving messages, that repentance is more than just you feeling sorry for your sin, but it's, it's you deciding to do something about it, right? It's God's kindness that leads us into that repentance is what scripture says. A lot of us can beat ourselves up and we can just think like, okay, I've gotten in this cycle of sin again. Let me just feel bad about it and tell God that I'm sorry and try to do better. That's not repentance. That's not repentance. It means to, it means to literally turn around and to go the opposite direction than where you are. And I love that we get such an image of that with this son. It's that he's done wrong He feels bad about it. He has really dropped the ball. He's wasted his life, his father's life, his money, all these things. And it's not just him sitting around and sulking and saying, well, I've screwed up and, you know, hope I tried again. That's that's how we get into a cycle of sin. When we we just think it's all about feelings and it's not about an action behind it, it makes it easier for us to engage in sin later. Like when we're, we're going through something, we're saying, all right, God, I feel bad about this. I feel awkward. I'm sorry. That's it. And then that awkwardness maybe fades away, but there's no, there's no, uh, there's no like physicality behind that that's, that's pushing us in an opposite direction. You want to leave sin behind. You want to move on to, f- from something that you're struggling with. Um, you have to put action behind it. You have to turn and walk in, the, in an opposite direction. And that looks different for everybody in this room. But what looks the same is that all of us have things in our lives that we can repent from. All of us have things in our lives that we have to repent of. But that, re- that requires not just feeling crummy about it, not just sitting and sulking about it, but deciding to put action behind our sorrow, put action behind the shame that we're feeling or this guilt that we're feeling and deciding to follow Jesus and walk in the opposite direction. That's what this son is doing. It's more than a feeling. And so it says that when he did this, his father saw him. He felt compassion. He ran. He embraced him. He kissed him. Uh, this was not something that men did back then. The Middle East patriarchy, they weren't known for, they had these little uh, skirts on or these little robes. I don't have one. I should have wore a little shepherd's robe to show you. But uh, they would hike them up over their legs. You could see their chicken legs, and they would, they would take off running. This was not something that was for grown men to start doing at that time. Running around and acting a fool and going crazy was something that was, you know, uh, that's what kids do. That's what children do. Uh, but this father was overwhelmed so much because of his love for the son that he didn't care what society thought. He didn't care what the community thought. He didn't care what other people around him thought. He was going to embrace his son. He was going to come up to his son and run to meet him when he saw him return to him. And so this might be like a cliche example, but I started thinking, you know, people say all the time, like, there's just no better feeling than holding, holding your baby, holding your son, holding your daughter. Um, that's, that's really true. There is really no other feeling like that. Uh, I started thinking about my kid, and 
just the ways that sometimes she drives us a little nuts. Um, you know, she could be destroying the living room for the eighth time uh, in one day or spilling her drink or being sassy with her mom or whatever. Um, when she knows that she's in trouble, she still reaches out. When she knows that she's done something wrong, uh, she reaches out to us and ultimately just wants to know that it's okay. Ultimately just wants to know that she's safe, that she's loved, that she's still accepted. And there's something about it. Maybe, maybe you have a kid and you're cold-hearted towards that. We'll pray for you after the service. But there's something in me that when I see my daughter come to me and running back to me or, or knowing that she's done something wrong but still wants to be with me, uh, there's nothing inside of me that will never accept that, right? There's nothing inside of me that says, like, I'm going to be too, too far away from, from forgiving her again. And so I'd like to feel like, man, this is, uh, this is what this father is feeling in this moment. Uh, it's not about how good my kid says that she's sorry to me. It's not about how much she cleans up her mess or how much she, you know, does to try to make things better that makes me love her more. It's just the simple fact that she belongs to me. That's why I love her. That's, that's why I choose to say it's okay or I'll hold her or whatever it is. And that's the same with God. It's not about how good our apology is. It's not about how many times we can say I'm sorry. It's not about how much we, we can really do to show God that we're sorry or to show God that we're, we're repentant. The, the, the mere fact is, is that God chooses to forgive us. God chooses to embrace us, not because of anything we've done or not done, but it's because of who he is, because he is our father. And that's what is communicated here in this story is that, man, God wants to lead you into repentance. And it's not because of anything good or anything that uh, any way that you can try to, to earn it. It's because of the goodness of who he is. That's that's why he accepts you. That's why he embraces you. That's why he forgives you. That's why he's willing to meet you with open arms when you repent. That's when he that's why he's he's willing to take you over and over again and to forgive you is because not not because of anything that you've done or not done, but because you are his child. I started thinking about that. It's so true. And John, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us and to forgive our sins, to clean us from all unrighteousness. Romans 2, 4 says, Do you not despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. It's not our shame. It's not our guilt. It's not our feeling bad about what we've done that should lead us to repentance. It's the kindness of God. It's the goodness of God. It's how much he loves us. It's how much he sacrifices for us. It's how overwhelmed he is when we come into his presence, knowing that we're his child. His kindness leads us into that repentance. And I want to encourage you this morning if you need to repent of something, if you need to lay something down at the feet of Jesus, it's God's kindness inviting you to do that this morning. Verse 21 says, And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and put shoes on his feet. It might seem like the father, let's just put some clothes on this guy, get him a wife beater and listen, you know, not let him be naked anymore. It's so much more than that. Put a ring on his finger. This was so significant. Back then, when you like signed a document, it wasn't just you took a little pen and just signed your name. A lot of well-off families or, or, or families of high importance, they would have like a ring with a seal on it. And that would signify that you belong to somebody respectable that you are a part of a family that could be easily recognized. And so for the father to say to them, put a ring on his finger, it wasn't just for him to have some, you know, some, some nice accessories here. It was showing to people that he has a sense of belonging again. He is part of this family. He's not outcast. He is not, uh, he, he is not gone astray. He is not just going to be you know, maybe welcomed in for just a little bit. He belongs to this family. In a robe, it says that, uh, you know, families would be marked by what they wore. Uh, you would recognize them by maybe the way that they dressed. And it's implied in the scripture when he says, go get the best robe for my son, that he's got a lot of other robes. 
He's got a lot of other shirts. He's got a lot of other things in his closet, but he says, bring him the best robe and put it on him because you would have been known as part of this family because of your outer appearance. He's not just saying, go get some clothes and put it on him, but he's saying, bring him the best robe so that everybody can see that he belongs to this house. And can you imagine what this son must have looked like? He's been in a far off country not only been off in a far-off country, but he's squandered everything. He's lost all his money. He's been walking around in the dirt. He's been working with pigs, wanting to eat the same thing that uh, they're eating. He's probably not, you know, dressed to the nines. Um, And so this father is saying, let's put the best on him so that he knows and so that the people know around him that he is still a part of this family. There's a verse in Isaiah 61, verse 10. It says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. That is what we receive when we step into a relationship with God. It's not any good outward appearance of our own. It's not us coming to God with our best. It's God giving us his best through Jesus. And that's what this story is signifying, that when we come into repentance to God, when we step into a belief of who he is, when we return to the things of God, when we return to him, he doesn't shame us, he doesn't guilt us, but he brings us his best, his righteousness, not our own. Because this guy didn't have any righteousness about him. He had the opposite of that. But his father still said to him, let me put this garment on him. Let me put this robe on him to show people that he belongs to me. And that's what God does for you. That's what God does for us when we ask for forgiveness. He doesn't clothe us in guilt. He doesn't clothe us in, well, maybe, uh, maybe in a little while you'll, I'll give you something better. His forgiveness for us is immediate. He says, let's put sandals on his feet. This was also really significant because he'd obviously squandered everything he had down to his feet, right? And it's back then, the only people that would... Uh, walk around barefooted would have been like the slaves or the servants of that household. And so by giving him sandals again, the father is saying, I'm, I'm essentially restoring your place and your position to this family, right? These things are so significant because not just because the father is doing this for the kid, but this is just a perfect mirror image of what God does in our relationship with him, when we have this moment of realization, when we come to our senses, when the Holy Spirit convicts us and convinces us to return to God, it's easy to have this like, this moment of like, okay, well, let me just ease back into my relationship with God. Let me just like, um, I've done something really bad. I've I've screwed up a lot. I'll just kind of like hang out and maybe just kind of observe until I stop feeling awkward. I don't know if y'all have ever had like an argument with your spouse before where it's like, Uh, You argue about something stupid, and then uh, neither one of you say that you're sorry, and you just kind of wait and just kind of hope that things aren't awkward. Anybody been there before? I've been there before. I'm sorry. Um, But, uh, you know, you just, you just kind of, you kind of linger and wait for the awkwardness to go away, and then maybe you'll, you'll watch Parks and Rec later or something, or you'll just like, you know, things will just kind of disappear, and you'll feel better again. Uh, I think we're tempted to treat God like that sometimes, like we've done something, we know that we've done wrong, so we just like, we think like, well, it'll be really, really awkward if I just like act like everything's normal again, so uh, let me just kind of like, maybe, maybe not go to church for the next couple of weeks, I'll just maybe, you know, here and there, dip my toes in, or maybe I, I just won't hang around the people of God or who God's called me to, to be around or the people in my life that are encouraging me. I'll just kind of like wait until I feel more comfortable or more like, you know, feel like myself again. That's, that's not what God is inviting us into. His, uh, his forgiveness for us and restoration uh, into his family is immediate. It's not, he's not putting us on some like, we, we, we get this like weird, put ourselves on probation period um, where it's like, man, well, I'm going to step back into the things of God or I'm going to step back into my relationship with God, but I'm going to like, you know, just, just know that at any given moment he could kick me back out again or I'm going to get in trouble again. It's not like that. There's no probation period in your forgiveness with God. It's immediate. It is immediate, this restoration The father didn't waste any time. He didn't say, well, you know, you can sleep outside for like two weeks. 
Um, and then you can move into the servant's house, and then, then you can come to dinner. I'll slide you a plate under the floor, maybe like your parents did when you are grounded. Um, or you can eat in your room, or you can just stay by yourself until things get better. It's he immediately restored him into his family. It was right then and there. And I want to encourage you this morning that, man, if you're just like just debating on whether or not to ask God for forgiveness, do it. Do it this morning. If you're debating whether or not to repent of something or to lay something at the feet of Jesus this morning because you're afraid of that awkwardness or you're afraid of what other people might think or you're afraid of what it might mean, I want to encourage you this morning to do it because God's forgiveness for you is immediate. He doesn't make you wait around for things to not be awkward. He doesn't make you wait around for things to be good again. He's bringing that goodness to you the moment you decide to turn around. Verse 23, it says, bring the fattened calf, kill it. Let us eat, let us celebrate, for this son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found, and they began to celebrate. A farmer, um, you know, somebody like this who would have had a cow, they didn't just kill and slaughter calves for just like dinner every night. It had to be a, a, a really, really special occasion, something like a wedding, something like a big celebration or feast. And what this father is saying is that my son returning back home is good enough for me to give him my best. I'm going to clothe him in my best. I'm going to give him my best. I'm going to let him back into my house with no questions asked. I'm going to, I'm going to have this feast for him. I'm going to celebrate because that's who God is for us. He celebrates when we decide to return to him. The father sees his return as important as a great holiday or as a wedding feast. He didn't just say like, uh, he made some mistakes, and now he's going to do better. He's saying, my son was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and he's now found. And I heard this before. I didn't make this up, but this quote says that the gospel doesn't make bad people good. It makes dead people alive. And that's what, that's what salvation does for us. We don't, when we step into this relationship with God or we repent of something or we just kind of get back on following Jesus, it's not like, Oh, I'm going to make Brad 2.0 a new version of him, or I'm just going to give you a, like a software update or something, or you'll just be a new and improved version of yourself. When you, when you receive salvation from Jesus, you move from death to life. It's not just from bad to good. It's from death to life. And this is what it's signifying in this, in this story here is that, you know, yeah, he was lost or that he was doing bad things, but it's not just like, oh, I want to make my son good again. I want to make him feel alive again. I want to give him this new identity. And that's what the Father does for him. And no matter what sin, no matter what we've been struggling with, no matter how far that we've veered off course, no matter how many times we get ourselves into a cycle of sin, God is waiting for us patiently to return to him. And I want to encourage you to do that this morning. In verse 25, it goes on to tell about the other son. It says this, it says, Now his older son was in the field, and he came and he drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, Your brother's come, and your father's killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he said to his father, Look, Many years I've served you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you've never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came who devoured all your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and to be glad. For this, your brother was dead, and he is alive. He was lost, and now he's found. We have the younger son whose uh, sin is more on display. His sin is more apparent. He's wasted all that the Father's given him. He's moved out. He's done all these things with his money and his inheritance. He looks like garbage, and he returns back to his Father. Everybody sees this sin. But we also have this, this, uh, this other son whose heart is also far from the Father because when he learns that his brothers come back, his heart is hard towards him. He says, I did all these things that you asked me to do. I've never been disobedient to you. You've never thrown me some sort of feast. You've never done anything like this for me. So we have this contrast that should really be named the prodigal sons uh, with a, 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 a quotation, not quotation mark, I went to Hus. parentheses, parentheses S. 
Because both of these sons in this story were far off from the heart of the father. Because the heart of the father is about restoration. It's about forgiveness. It's about celebration. It's about a future. One guy had squandered it all and one, one son was mad that it was happening in the first place. So where do you find yourself this morning in, in this parable, in this story? Like I said earlier, all of us have things in our lives that we got to lay down at the feet of Jesus. All of us have something that we need to repent from. Your repentance might look like, man, I've strayed far from God. I've been engaging in something in this life. I've gone outside of, the, uh, of this fence. I've tried to seek freedom for myself, but I've got to come back to God. Maybe, maybe your sin is, maybe it's a little less apparent than that. Maybe it's this self-righteousness. Maybe it's this, man, I think I'm doing all the things of God, but things in my life aren't working out. What are you doing, God? Or I've done all these things, or, and I'm not at this place yet. Or God hasn't given me this yet. Or I've, I, I've tried to do all these think, good things for you, God. What are you doing in my life? It's easy to be in both situations, but both situations here require repentance. It requires us coming back to the heart of God, saying that, God, your way is the best way. My way, my selfishness will lead me to sin, or my selfishness will lead me to have a hardened heart. So what are you going to repent of this morning? What are you laying down before at the feet of God? Both sides of this sonship had forgotten something, and it's this. And this is the crux of this story here, is that their right standing with God doesn't come from what they've done. It comes from who the Father is. It doesn't come from what they've done or not done. It comes from how good the Father is. Would you stand with me as we close out today?